All righty, about to read chapter 10. I just want to ask everybody to once again, um, I apologize if I am not able to ec uh, edit certain sounds out. I'm not recording in a soundproof studio or soundproof booth of any kind. I'm literally having to record in my apartments and the quietest spots I can find. <laughs> so I apologize once again if you hear any noises and I cannot remove them. So here we go. Hopefully my amazing uh, narrating voice will make up for it. Chapter 10. Charlie's Nymphs. While Hollywood's naively exhibitionistic golden people romped through the roaring twenties at a killing pace, there existed in their midst a slight, solitary figure dedicated to the film as art. This man was British, and British he would remain. Charles Spencer Chaplin attended other people's parties, the fancy dress, not the wild kind, but he was never known to throw one. This perfectionist preferred to build his own studio on land he purchased on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and La Brea, and spend months on costly retakes on his pictures. Chaplin did not seek out scandal. Scandal came to him. Chaplin had been the subject of diverse speculations in the film colony since his meteoric rise to fame. Some of these speculations dealt with his alleged avariciousness, but the most popular theme for gossip was the way the little man had with women. His name was linked at various times with Edna Perviance, Lila Lee, Josephine Dunn, Anna Q. Nilsson, Thelma Morgan Converse, Mae Collins, Claire Windsor, Claire Sheridan, and Poland Negri. A big woman in Charlie's love life was also one of the world's richest, the original gold-digging Ziegfeld girl Peggy Hopkins Joyce. She cruised into Hollywood with a $3 million bankroll, alimony from five husbands, mind you, in the Scandal Street year of 1922, just to see if the most talked-about sin city in the world measured up to its reputation. The birds agree with that. <laughs> Peggy arrived in Hollywood dressed in chic, well, chic est black set off by a display of emeralds and diamonds a young man had just taken his life on her account in paris her morning was confined to her wardrobe however and soon she and chaplin were having a dinner adieu or perhaps diner adieu it's french whatever her opener had a certain showgirl candor is it true though is it true what all the girls say that you're hung like a horse the big blonde and the little fellow were soon enjoying a summer sojourn on the island of Catalina, Charlie having set aside preparations for his next project, Napoleon, to indulge his idyll. Charlie and Peggy sought out a secluded cove on the far side of the island where they could picnic and do some nude bathing, unobserved, or so they believed. The presence of two celebrities on the little island had not gone unnoticed, however, and several of the more intrepid native Catalinians had hiked up the mountain overlooking the cove, equipped with powerful binoculars. Soon afterwards, the wild goats native to Catalina acquired the nickname Charlie's. During their brief but intense friendship, Peggy regaled Chaplin with the story of her life as a gold-digging adventuress. Chaplin put these anecdotes to good use. Several incidents in uh, Peggy's early career provided him, providing him with the necessary inspirations for his film, A Woman of Paris. The little women in Charlie's Hollywood career established his reputation as a chicken hawk. The first nymphette was a blonde little Mildred Harris, who was 14 when she and Charlie met at a blanket party on Santa Monica Beach. She was just 16 when Charlie asked her to marry him. He had been informed of her pregnancy, and it seemed the sporting thing to do. The marriage on October 23, 1918, was but 48 hours old when one of the new studio's nabobs, an ex-junk dealer named Louis, uh, Louis Mayer that is, flashed a contract at Mildred. It was signed. Mildred had a cute face, but was no actress. Mayer, however, saw the, sal the salability, or salability, whatever the word is, of billing her as Mrs. Charlie Chaplin. The contract annoyed Chaplin, who had not been consulted. Mayer announced with his great fanfare that the first feature starring Mrs. Charlie Chaplin, you know, Mildred Harris, would be a saga of domestic discord entitled The Inferior Sex. As a legit couple, 29-year-old Charlie and 16-year-old Mildred didn't hit it off too well. Chaplin confided wistfully to Fairbanks that his young with child bride was, quote, no mental heavyweight, end quote. <laughs> it's a very, uh, very mean thing to say about your future wife and future mother of your children. A note of tragedy was injected when Mildred almost died in childbirth. The baby boy was a deformed monster who lived only three days. He was buried in Hollywood Memorial Park Cemetery under a headstone marked The Little Mouse, with an undertaker's prop smile fixed on his face. He had never smiled. While Mayer launched a publicly campaign or publicity campaign based on the famous comedian's wife, the Charlie Mildred marriage went 
and they began accusing each other. She charged cruelty, he charged infidelity on the nation's front pages. Chaplin was too discreet to draw attention to the nature of her flights from the conjugal bed, often to spend the night with uh, Metro's woman of a thousand moods, Nazimova. Charlie was also fed up with Mayer's tacky exploitation of his name to promote Mildred's films, the second of which was a quickie Mary Pickford in, uh, imitation titled Polly of the Storm Country. Given Chaplin's mood, it was evident that sparks would soon fly. A chance encounter occurring April 8, April 8, 1920, in the crowded dining room of the fashionable Alexandria Hotel. Seated at opposite tables, Chaplin accused Mayer of encouraging Mildred to up the ante of their divorce settlement. When Mayer stalked out of the hotel's lobby, Chaplin followed. Mayo turned and shouted, You filthy pervert! Chaplin dared him to remove his glasses, upon which Mayer whipped them off with his left and socked Charlie with his, uh, with his right. A solicitous, a solicitous Jack Pickford uprighted Charlie from the potted palm into which he had collapsed and led him away, dripping blood. Mayer, who had learned to scrap during his rough days as New Brunswick ironmonger, sneered as he watched him go. I only did what any man would have done. And that is the end of chapter uh, 10. Uh, in case you're interested in looking up Nazimova, I have never heard of this person before, uh, but this is somebody that definitely looks like they had a very brief but very high stint in the old Hollywood uh, lore, if you guys want to look it up. N-A-Z-I-M-O-V-A.